All right, so I'm gonna um, hand it over to Sydney or Brianna, whoever would like to introduce themselves. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you, can you all hear me? Okay, good. My uh, headphones are doing something funny. <laughs> um, but good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sydney Walker. I'm the MRC med medical lead, um, but I'm also a nurse for uh, Philadelphia Department of Public Health's um, Bioterrorism and Public Health Preparedness Program, along with uh, Satori and Brianna. And I'm also a nurse for the Immunizations Program. And then I'm going to pass it on over to Brianna. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna. I'm new here with the team. I'm a workforce specialist for the MRC unit, and I'll be working alongside Satori and you all. So I'm happy to be here and happy to get to know you all. Thank you both. Um, and we're really excited to have Brianna a part of our team. Um, she'll be helping out, like she said, with a lot of MRC events, activities, appointments. So you'll be seeing her face. I still just wanted to introduce her to everybody so you'll get to know her um, as the time goes on. And we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, if there are any technical difficulties, I apologize. These things are always fun nav to navigate, but hopefully we won't have any issues. Alrighty. Is everybody able to see the screen? Yes? Okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. All right, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, also, I'm just going to apologize. There's I live near the train, so if you hear that in the background, that is what that noise is. I apologize. I'll try to speak over it. Um, but all right, so this is the special large-scale event deployments and volunteer opportunities training session um, presented by myself, your MRC coordinator, Cindy Walker, um, who's also a registered nurse, but is your MRC medical lead lead and Brianna Thomas, who is our new MRC workforce assistant, as we just mentioned. And our agenda for this evening is as follows. I'm going to, or Brianna, I'm sorry, is going to start off speaking to you about some just general MRC history and other useful information that you should know, um, being that you are volunteers within our unit. Um, she's going to speak to some MRC partnerships that we've cultivated, strengthened, and kind of honed over the years and how that plays into our role within um, not only the health department, but within the city as well, within emergency responses. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about training and deployment prep, um, some of the upcoming special large scale event deployments we have and other volunteer opportunities that will be made available for you all. Um, the el eligibility criteria for specifically for special event deployments um, related to clinical and non clinical volunteers. And then we'll move into talking about the volunteer deployment process as a whole and other useful information um, pertaining to that. Um, we'll then kind of move into talking about the MRC primary point of contacts for when you're out in the field at these deployments, large scale special events, whatever it may be, um, there will always be someone designated uh, to be your support. And so that we'll talk about that. And then we'll kind of wrap up with a quick Q&A. If you have any questions um, that I haven't already answered in covering this presentation um, that you would like us to speak a little bit more to or clarify anything that, you know, um, maybe confusing or maybe you just like some more detailed information about um, and then we'll kind of lead into Sydney's presentation and she'll talk to you about some sports medicine training, um, some tips and you know some tricks about things that you should know when you're supporting these large scale events, whether that's a sporting event like the broad sugar you just had, or something, you know, like the Welcome America event that's upcoming where you may have to utilize some of those skills um, for this deployment in the off chance that something may happen. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Brianna and she's gonna to speak to you about some MRC history. Brianna? Yep. So we're gonna start with some history about the Medical Reserve Corps also referred to as the MRC. The MRC was founded after the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers in 2002. In the same realization that there was a great need for a massive workforce nationally, it was also noted that that same need was here in Philadelphia. So in 2005, the Philly MRC unit was founded to respond to emergency disasters and large scale events if and when needed. Our unit is involved in various emergency responses such as vaccination clinics and sites, community canvassing and outreach initiatives. One of our biggest responses was for the pandemic response in March of 2020, in which we deploy volunteers to support COVID-19 efforts um, all the way until May of 2022. Overall, the MRC is an organization that is greatly needed nationally and locally, and we are happy that you all are here to help serve um, for these efforts that we all put forth. 
So all of our work here would not be possible alone. We have uh, some partnerships with key organizations here in the community so that we can work in effective and efficient manner. We work with the Philadelphia Office of Emergency Management and they help us to transport our logistical materials and supplies to and from deployment sites. We also have a really strong relationship with the Philadelphia Police Department in which we provide them with three annual flu clinics every year. Um, and this helps with our volunteers to gain clinical and non-clinical practice skills in preparation for and of uh, when and if they are needed to inoculate first responders in the community. And lastly, uh, we have a really great relationship with the Philadelphia Fire Department. We work alongside them in their medical tents at any large scale special events, such as the Wawa Welcome to America event that we're currently pre preparing for. And in the past, we've also worked at the Made in America concert, the Broad Street Run and other similar events. And so um, thank you all. And Satori will continue the presentation from here. Thanks, Brianna. All right, so um, just as Brianna mentioned, we do have quite a few large scale special event deployments um, coming up. Um, so the, the one that everyone loves is the uh, Made in America Music Festival that happens every Labor Day weekend in Philadelphia. Um, if you're either from Philly or if you live in the surrounding area, you know this is a huge event. Um, it basically shuts down anything in Center City. Um, it stretches from the beginning of the parkway all the way until um, the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And what we do there is, like Brianna mentioned, we support the fire department in their EMS and medical tents in both a non-clinical and clinical capacity, depending on what type of volunteer support um, was requested by our partners at PFD. Um, and so it's a, it's a lovely, I mean, it's a large scale event, but it's a lovely way to kind of connect with all the volunteers, network and meet other clinical um, professionals, other EMS you know, professionals and other um, city organizational um, related professionals as well. And so this is a two day event. Um, so it, this year, I believe it's September 1st and 2nd. Um, don't, I don't wanna misquote those dates, but more information will be coming out about that. Um, in the survey that you all got not too long ago um, to sign up for some upcoming events, that was on there as well. So definitely revisit that survey if that's something you overlooked or may you know be interested in now. There'll be trainings um, pertaining to that specific deployment and to every each of these um, large scale special deployments will have a specific designated training pertaining to that. So you guys can you know learn the ins and outs of, of what is expected for that deployment um, in terms of in terms of credentials, training, um, you know, meeting locations and other uh, pertinent information such as that. And so um, that's the biggest one, you know, so I, I started to put that up there because that's the one that everyone typically brushes and signs up for. Um, we typically look for a lot of clinical professionals. So um, nurses, doctors, uh, physicians, you know, physicians, orthopedic surgeons, whatever, you know, the, the case may call for, um, but, you know, EMTs as well. Um, there's non-clinical roles there um, to help with patient tracking and other, um, and other non-clinical capacities. And so it is a very, very busy deployment <laughs> that we support. It is never a dull moment, I will say that. And you all will hear more about this as we approach um, those dates. And then so I just wanna talk a little bit more about the first responder flu clinics that Brianna also touched on. These are uh, three annual clinics that we do every year in partnership or in conjunction with LEHB. Um, so we support the Philadelphia Police Department in a clinical and non-clinical capacity as well. Uh, whereas this is utilized as an exercise and in training experience, um, if and when we were called upon to inoculate first responders in a rapid response, um, you know, if they needed to go and serve the city in a large scale capacity or, you know, God forbid something horrible happened and, you know, we needed to like send EMTs, like all of our first responders out into the field, um, police, you know, whoever, um, EMS. So we wanted to make sure that we, not only we as in our unit was ready and able to inoculate them um, if and when, when need be, but also that we uh, strengthen that partnership with LEHB and with the, with the police department so that we already have a structure in place um, if we need to set that type of response or, uh, um, or clinic up. And so those are three clinics that happen, I think late October, mid, late, no, I'm sorry, uh, late September, beginning of October. Um, so it kind of stretches out within a two or three week period. Um, so more to come about that. If that's something you're interested in, you can definitely reach out to me about it and I'll, I'd be happy to give you more info. And then the most recent deployment we just had in terms of large scale events was the Broad Street Run. So I think that was, we had about, 
I want to say there was over 35,000 uh, runners that came out to, to do this event. Um, so a very large scale event. And, and what we did there is, again, we supported the fire department in their EMS and medical tents. And we just treated um, runners who had various you know, injuries from the event. Um, and that is a little bit more about what Sydney is going to touch on in terms of sports medicine and tips, tips and tricks to kind of take care of those who come in who experience, um, or I'm sorry, who um, who show that they need certain types of care. So that was the Broad Street Run, and that was a, an accessible uh, event. Um, everyone loved that deployment. I think we had close to 30, 35 MRC volunteers come out. So great way to exercise your skills, um, build on those skills as well, and then also meet, like I said before, other um, clinical and public health professionals. Um, the Philadelphia half and full marathon is very similar to the Broad Street Run. Only difference is, like Made in America, this is a two-day event as well. Um, the half marathon is on a Saturday, and then the full marathon is on a Sunday. Typically, this event is held in November, so it is very, very chilly, although the tent is um, heated. There are a lot of, as you can imagine, um, sports-related injuries because of the temperature, because of, you know, they, they're running marathons. Um, so we see a lot of injuries as well. And I'm sure Sydney will utilize this as um, an example in her presentation or references at some point. But yeah, so this is just another uh, event that we support um, the EMS and medical or the EMS and PFD in and their, and their medical tents. And yeah, there's also um, roles here for non-clinical volunteers as well. And I just want to say for any special large scale event, I will always preface or just put out there uh, whether or not it's clinical or non clinical, and that all depends on the need for that event or for that event. So we receive or I receive rather a request um, requesting volunteer support for all of these events, and based off of what was requested from the partners, whether that's the police department or PFD, the fire department. Um, I then fill in those roles and that's how I survey all of you and I'll go through that deployment process a little later on in the presentation, but just to give you all some background on how these special events are staffed. Um, and then as Brianna mentioned earlier, the Wawa Welcome America Festival is coming up. That'll be July 1st, I believe. Um, and we'll have clinical and non-clinical volunteers again in, the, in those EMS and medical tents to help support um, that event. And that is a public event, so it's not gated or secured as Made in America or um, the marathon events would be. And so there are a lot of people. Again, this is held on the parkway. Um, we, I will be speaking more to this in a specific training that will be provided for volunteers attending this deployment. Um, it's a shorter deployment, so I think it's I want to quote myself, but I believe it's like 11 to six or something like that or shorter. I do it in shifts, depending on what's best for the volunteers for that day and what's asked of us. But it's a great day to kind of get out there, um, network with other volunteers, get to know, you know, your Philadelphia Fire Department and your local um, city organizational partners. And then it's because it's a family oriented event. Um, we've had volunteers in the past, you know, their families would come and kind of join them after the deployment was over and they would go and enjoy the event as well. So, but we'll talk more about that, um, you know, as the time approaches, but those are just the four annual large scale special event deployments that we staff and support every year. And now we're going to talk about the volunteer deployment process. So you guys are very familiar with this at this point. Um, what you'll do is, you know, what we always do, which is I send out um, you're going to register to become a volunteer. That's the first step. And you guys have all done that, obviously, because you're here. And then once you're registered to become a volunteer, you'll then be able and eligible to sign up for volunteer deployments and um, volunteer opportunities. And what that looks like, you all know, um, you'll receive a email from us with a survey link attached, and then it'll list the volunteer deployment opportunities that are available to you, whether that's um, special large scale events, like any of the ones I just mentioned in the last couple of slides, or training opportunities such as these. Um, a lot of our training opportunities are tailored specifically either to um, specific deployments or uh, catered towards uh, specific topics, um, whether it's, you know, fentanyl testing strip trainings or Narcan or um, first aid or mental first aid or psychological first aid, something around that. Um, and we'll, you know, I try to give as much information as I possibly can to you all um, so you can decide, you know, what you're interested in, what piques your interest or what you want to do. Um, after you decide, you know, what you're interested in and what you want to sign up for, you'll then 
register through that survey link um, with the opportunity you are interested in, and then you'll receive a deployment email from us. You guys all know that no one is to deploy without deployment summary. Um, that is just the one rule that I have is no self-deploying. And so basically what that looks like is after, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I received that initial request. Let's say if it's a clinic and they ask for five registered nurses, I'll send out that survey based off um, who signs up. And I also pull exports daily just to make it fair because it is first come first serve because we have, we're blessed to have over seven, 7,156, if I remember correctly, volunteers at this current moment um, in order to be equitable and fair to all. I just first come first serve is my, my rule of thumb. Um, so I, I kind of, I sign up volunteers based off of, you know, how quick they are to kind of sign up. Um, but that's not to say that if you, haven't received a deployment summary from us once you are selected and identified to deploy, um, you, you're always welcome to email us. Um, I put my personal contact number out there and I'll put it out again at the end of this presentation. You can contact me um, for anything. If you're really, really interested in like a specific deployment or a specific training, I'm willing to work with um, work with you in any way that I can to make that happen. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is your volunteer experience and I wanna make sure um, that you're getting you know the most out of this um, organization. So we're here for you. We want to make it work. So if you don't hear back from us either, you know, directly with a deployment summary, or maybe, you know, if you miss the email, sometimes it does end up, end up in your, your junk or your spam folder, or if you are confused by a deployment summary or anything really, you can always reach out and ask us about it. Um, and we'll definitely, like I said, work with you um, that way. Once you arrive on site to said deployment, for example, Wawa Welcome America, all volunteers know I'm big on getting your signatures. That is what we, we track our all of our volunteer um, all of our volunteer activities. Um, I then report them to the state and the Department of Health so they can see all the wonderful work that we're all doing. So you'll sign in, and if you're a brand new volunteer, um, we'll ask that you sign, you read a review, and then you sign a uh, volunteer waiver. And there's a confidentiality clause and a liability clause. Um, we can explain both to you, both to you in depth in person. Just a, a quick overview of what that is. Volunteers have access, depending on the deployment, you'll have access to, to sensitive um, HIPAA related or you know sense uh, confidential information. And whether that's with patient tracking or if you're responding and you're supporting a, an, a vaccination clinic or anything like that, we just like to make sure that we cover our bases and that you understand that you're not to disseminate said confidential information or take photos or pictures or do anything appropriate with that information, which you guys are all wonderful. I brag about how great my volunteers are, so I know no, no one's doing that, um, but that is just, you know, um, something that we ask all new volunteers to sign. And then there's a liability side as well. It is double-sided. Um, and that liability is just outlining your role as a volunteer, basically saying that you're going to, you know, stay within your scope of practice, that you're not going to do things that, you know, weren't asked of you or weren't outlining your scope of practice. If you're not a nurse or not a clinician, you're not going to start vaccinating people at a clinic, things like that. So, and again, I, I'm happy to have um, a more in-depth conversation with anyone who has specific questions about the, the waivers, but that's a general idea of what those are. So on-site training, we like to call them JITs, so just-in-time trainings. Um, regardless of whatever the deployment or activity is or exercises, you'll always receive um, detailed information before, during, and then probably, you know, just a, a thank you after the, the activity or the opportunity or deployment has taken place. Um, we'll all, always give you, like I said earlier, as much information as we possibly can to make sure that you're as informed as you can be um, before you arrive to that deployment. But on site, we'll also give you your JIT so that you're just as informed. And even if there are any updates or anything that, you know, new information that has circulated, we want to make sure we get that to you. We also want to make sure that we reiterate what your specific roles and volunteer responsibilities are so everyone's on the same page. There's no gray areas. Um, we want to be, uh, want to be very clear uh, with what you can expect as a volunteer arriving on site. And that'll be, the, again, the time that you'll ask any questions and your, your, um, your leads, whether that's a clinical lead or non-clinical lead, they'll identify themselves at that uh, particular time. And then again, I mentioned this earlier, but the acting within your scope of practice, I'm not gonna harp too much on this because I know Sydney is going to cover this beautifully. Um, this is basically just reminding you, again, as an example, if you aren't a nurse, you're not gonna start picking up a needle and vaccinating people. If you are a nurse, you know, you're gonna do, with, uh, do what's within your scope of practice and with uh, what's been outlined for you specifically and nothing outside of that. 
um, an on-site point of contact. So your MRC, POC, or point of contact will always be designated before um, and also during your um, deployment. Nine times out of 10, that'll be myself or Brianna or Sydney as your MRC medical lead. Um, but we'll always make sure that you know um, who your support is on site before and then when once you arrive. Um, if you have any deployment questions or any questions pertaining any deployment or opportunity or exercise or training um, at all, you can always feel free to email us at mrc at villa.gov. Brianna and I, now that there's two of us, we'll both be monitoring um, that inbox and we'll get back to you um, as soon as we can with the best answer that we can come up, um, you know, kind of provide for you at that moment. Um, but yeah, open line of communication both ways. So please just let us know if you need anything and how we can support you. I kind of covered this, so I'm just going to briefly cover this, but your arrival time, meeting location, check-in, all the pertinent information that you'll need pertaining your, to your deployment will be covered in your deployment summary. All volunteers are expected to arrive um, on time, preferably for your uh, deployment shift. And that is because for a lot of these special large-scale events, um, these, uh, these events have a lot of security and they are high-level events. So arriving on time is very essential because if you arrive even 15 minutes late, I've had our volunteers, it's been very difficult to kind of get them through, um, even with credentials, because for instance, for Made in America, it's a high security event. So they kind of block off everything around the parkway. Um, if you arrive, especially if you're driving into these events, you have to be on time or you either won't get let in or it'd be very difficult for you to navigate your way through. Um, Broad Street Run, for an example, it was a very early start date. I think the arrival time was like 6.30 a.m. And that's because they closed down Broad Street at 7 a.m. and also parts of I-95. And so if you weren't there before then, it was almost impossible for you to kind of access the location um, to meet up with us. And so that's why I stress arrival time. If you, for whatever reason, I understand, you know, life happens, family emergencies happen, unfortunately, things get in the way. If for whatever reason you cannot join us that day, please just let us know. Even if it's five minutes before the deployment, I don't care. Please just send me a, a text or call me, leave me a voicemail, whatever you can do, an email. I'd appreciate any form of communication to let me know that you won't be there that day so that we can figure out a way um, to support your role in another capacity or, you know, um, find a replacement for you. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say about that. And then obviously when you arrive on site, you're gonna check in with your designated MRC point of contact. Driving directions, parking passes and public transportation op uh, options. So again, all of these will be covered in your deployment summaries. This is just an example I believe from Made in America last year um, for where volunteers were to park. I try to provide as much detailed information as I possibly can about parking and about driving. I received my, uh, in full disclosure, I received all of my information from our partners, whether it's with the fire department or from the police department. They tell me what to tell you and what to inform you. And so I'm so sorry if, you know, the day comes and it may be a little confusing. I try to um, specify and simplify as much as I possibly can exactly on where to go, how to get there, who to ask for directions and things like that. I do try my very best to make it as easy as possible for you. Um, but if you have suggestions or ways in which you think I can improve it or we can improve this process for you, please let us know. We also do site visits. Um, I've also been to every, you know, each one of these deployments before, so I kind of have a good idea in mind of how to get you there, but I'm always open to any feedback from my volunteers, so please let us know. Um, if you've been to one of these events and if you think there's an easier way for people walking or biking or busing or driving, let us know and we'll be happy to kind of see if we can incorporate some of those ideas to make it more efficient and easier for everybody. But all these locations, um, regardless of the deployment, um, are easily accessible, I retract that word easily, are accessible <laughs> um, via public transit, biking, or walking. And we'll always provide alternative um, uh, travel options to you as well in your deployment summary. So all that will be covered in your deployment summary. All right, in terms of credentials and volunteer roles, um, for high-level events such as the Broad Run, the Philadelphia Marathon, and Made in America, um, we do have uh, security credentials that we'll have to provide for you either before or the day of. Typically, it's going to be the day of um, just because it's easier to kind of get everyone in one location and then disseminate them that way. Um, but for these events, for example, for the Wawa Welcome to America event, um, there's no gated security so you won't need credentials for this event so you don't have to worry about that for my volunteers who are going to that you'll just show up and you'll be fine you'll be good to go um for all events though regardless of whether you'll have passes or credentials 
we do ask that you wear um, your Philadelphia MRC t-shirt. Obviously, if it's cold, you don't have to. If it's in the winter, winter months, you dress comfortably and according to the weather conditions. Uh, but in the summertime, we do ask that you, or in the warmer months, we do ask that you dress um, in your MRC uniform t-shirts. It can be any of the t-shirts. I know we have like three or four versions out there right now. Uh, you can wear any of those versions. Um, it just helps you um, be easily identifiable as an MRC volunteer. It helps us kind of track where everyone is. And it's just nice to kind of have us all um, looking in a little bit more of a uniform manner. And I also may or may not ask you to take a picture. I'm, I'm big on that. So I, I like to sneak them in um, and showcase the work that you all do. So yeah, if you guys can wear your t-shirts, I'd be greatly appreciate that. I would greatly appreciate that, excuse me. And um, if you don't have a t-shirt already, we always bring them the day of the deployment. So we'll always bring extras for anybody who doesn't have them. I bring all sizes. So you don't have to worry about that. And if you want an extra one, I'll have them for you as well. I'm always happy to kind of pass them out. So we'll have everything you'll need. Um, and we'll communicate all of that to you before um, and leading up to that event. And then we'll, again, go over your, whether you're clinical or non-clinical, we'll go over your volunteer roles and we all kind of get together at that union location and, and cover your JIT or your just-in-time training. All right, and then for this year, for anyone who may be attending the Wawa Welcome America Festival with us, um, just to make it easier when everyone, uh, whether you, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to restate that. To make it easier for everybody, when you check out or when your deployment is over, um, whether you're leaving at the end of the deployment, which I believe, don't quote me on this, will be 6 p.m., um, when that deployment is over, you can feel free to check out with me just by texting me, letting me know that you've left for the day or you're, you're going to go ahead and enjoy the rest of your evening, whatever the case may be. I just need to know where everyone is. It, as long as you're the, at that point in time where your shift is over or if we have to leave early or, you know, if you let me know that you were going to head out earlier um, than we intended or the event uh, was planned for, that's fine. Um, just please text me, let me know, just to so have accountability of, of where everyone is and just can keep track that way. And lastly, here is our contact information. As always, please feel free to contact us with any questions, concerns, suggestions, or any other, you know, additional information you may have or want from us. Um, you can always feel free to update your SERPA profile, at, you know, in your uh, SERPA account at www.serpa.pa.gov. Um, and then you can feel free to text, call, leave me a voicemail. Um, here's my personal contact information. Please use, please use this contact information if you have any questions. Um, please don't call Sydney or call Brianna. Their numbers will be listed as MRC point of contacts for several deployments. Um, but for any pertinent M or anything related to the MRC, please just contact me um, first. I will be your primary MRC contact for all of your needs. Um, even if it's a clinical related question, uh, please just contact me and then I'll put you in contact with Sydney, unless it's the day of, and then you can contact either any of us, whoever is on site. And again, your MRC point of contacts will be identified before and prior to your deployment. Um, you, you guys all should have our email by now, but there it is. And then as always, we are listed or, or we are on LinkedIn. So please follow us. We post updates um, about trainings, deployments. We also do some volunteer highlights to showcase um, the wonderful and great work that you all do. And with that, I will wrap it up. And I just wanna say thank you for being an MRC volunteer. Thank you for your time this evening. I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. And I hope to see you around. Um, I wish you know that this was informative and if anybody has any questions, we'll take some in the chat now. And if not, I'm gonna to toss over to Sydney. I think I do see something in the chat. So I'm just gonna look at that really quickly. Um, so the t-shirts, uh, they're not black. They're just like the, the t-shirts you see here in this picture. Um, any of these, so we have red, we have the most recent ones we have are these dark, like navy blue um, ones with the white logo. And then we also have like the gray ones, uh, the v-necks as well. Um, and I believe we have some like polos, some thicker polos, but we did just get some grant money. It'll eventually come to us where we can purchase um, new MRC attire for you all. So I have things planned for us. We're going to get jackets and vests and more t-shirts and other fun things. So more to come. But um, but yeah, that's to answer your question. No, they're, they're not black. We don't have any black shirts. All right. Are there any other questions? Someone asked Satori, sorry, um, if 
the Philadelphia MRC will be covering the World Cup 2026? I don't know. Uh, that's to be fair. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. We kind of get requests for the moment for events that aren't typically planned well ahead of ahead of time. Um, there is a fair chance, though, that if anything, it's fair to say that if any large scale events happens in Philadelphia, whether that you know whether the Eagles win the Super Bowl next year, whether the Phillies go to the World Cup, you know, whatever next year uh, or World Series, um, we'll we'll more than likely be involved in those responses. So. Yeah, and I'll definitely let you guys know. As soon as I know, I'll let you know. Even if I feel it or anticipate it coming, I'll definitely let you guys know. Um, but yeah, they'll more than likely if we will if it's in Philadelphia, more than likely we'll be involved. All right, it looks like that was the last question. Um, if you don't have a shirt yet, how do you? Okay, so if you don't have a shirt yet. Don't worry about getting one. I'll bring it to the deployment. If you want a shirt just to have a shirt, our office is at 11th and Market. You're always welcome to pick up one Monday through Friday between the hours of nine to five, um, as long as you email or text or, you know, let me know and we can coordinate that, um, you know, offline. And uh, I'd be happy to provide you one. I'll bring it down to the lobby for you, whatever you need. But um, if you're deploying to a site, you don't need to wear one. I'll bring one with you know, an extra for you to provide for you the day of. You won't need to need to bring one. Okay. All right. Um, since there aren't any more questions, wait. Okay, no problem. Um, since there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, and I'm gonna toss it over to Sydney, and she'll cover her portion of this presentation. Okay. Let me just go ahead and play. All right. So good evening, everyone. So today I'm, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and names. Um, and so a lot of you guys have either participated in one of our uh, special events or have seen this um, training before. Uh, so please, if you have any questions or need any clarity or you just want to like even add anything, please feel free to use the chat. Um, in the end, we'll have a you know question answer or just kind of a a moment to maybe you know share something that you've learned when we when you were with us out at one of the special events um but further ado no further ado i'm going to just go ahead and get started um so today i'm going to talk about common injuries injuries and illnesses at mrc special events and um, i'm also going to give you guys um uh the uh, scope of practice for mrc that i always give before we start a special event um just so you all um can kind of know what's expected and or what's not expected and what you can and cannot do while volunteering under um, the guise of of MRC. And okay, so I just kind of went over that. Uh, but yes, so let me just first stop just share a different screen here. Good practice. Okay. All right, so this is the MRC scope of practice, and it says the uh, Philadelphia Medical Reserve Corps volunteers support the Philadelphia Department of Public Health's response efforts to meet local um, medical and public health needs during emergencies and special events. Um, and so MRC volunteers may, uh, may also be involved in efforts to improve everyday health and reduce potential public health risks and vulnerabilities throughout Philadelphia's communities. And so to standardize the quality of care, all clinical volunteers, uh, regardless of their uh, profession, area of expertise, or level of expertise, should hold the following. And we're, when we're referring to clinical volunteers, we're referring to um, RNs, NPs, uh, physician assistant, uh, and, um, and MDs, and, and, or MDs or DOs, uh, medical doctor of some uh, sense. So we expect that you're able to recognize a uh, medical emergency and alert 911 and administer first aid, uh, provide basic life support, assess vital signs. So that includes blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and temperature. Um, and temperature, usually in our um, marathons, we'll do rectal temp they'll do rectal temperature temperatures, but we are not expected to do that. Um, 
We also expect that you um, are able to administer IM or sub-Q injections, and that's according to the PDPH medical standing order. And this is for vaccinations or um, pre-exposure uh, or post-exposure uh, prophylaxis purposes. We would um, also look for you to dispense oral medications according to the PDPH medical standing orders during a mass uh, prophylaxis response. Uh, distribute and administer oral uh, medications during a mass care event, um, and then perform initial assessments to alert EMS or partnering agencies. And so we expect that you're able to assess neurological functioning, uh, external body conditions or injuries, physical complaints or concerns. Uh, we also um, look for clinical documentation and the ability for you to lift over 50 pounds or more. So unless there's a surge and additional medical assistance is required to support uh, emergency responders, um, MRC volunteers are exempt from initiating peripheral IVs and administering um, IV medications. I, I also want to back up. I just want to add to our clinical group that uh, EMTs and paramedics are also included um, in that group. We just expect that everyone works under their uh, scope of practice. But anyway, um, if anything's, uh, if something is unavoidable, like initiating a peripheral IV or administering IV meds, um, the peripheral IV insertion or administration of medications must be approved and completed under the direct supervision of the medical operations lead on site. So whether that's myself or um, one of our other PDPH employees um, that is a clinician, they would be the ones to approve and um, and. Uh, observe that administration. Also, you are permitted to um, perform any, any invasive medical procedures or interventions. Um, so while assisting in a deployment, all MRC volunteers are only permitted to perform duties defined by their licensure. Any deviation or exceeding one scope of practice or level of training will result in removal from MRC. Okay. Are there any questions about that? seems pretty straightforward. And you don't have to try and remember that. We do go over um, this scope of practice before any special event. No? All right. So I'm going to switch back over to the PowerPoint. OK, so now that formality is done. Let's talk about marathons. And I know the special events that are coming up aren't marathons. Um, and some of the things that I listed as injuries that we may see at a marathon will probably also apply to um, the, the other, like the, the festivals that we'll do, especially with the, um, with the uh, heat strokes and things of that nature, okay? So the common illnesses in, um, that we see at the marathon events include like heat, cold, and exercise associated illness. Um, so that includes, you know, dehydration, heat rash, sunburn, muscle cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, uh, or hypothermia. And then there's minor injuries like cuts and grazes or blisters, uh, joint and bone injuries, so sprains, joint pain, shin splints, fractures, and then muscle injuries like tears or strains. And then there's of course the possibility of a uh, cardiac and respiratory emergencies. Um, I feel like this is very common uh, that we saw at least this past summer with Bad Bunny. Um, there were a lot of asthma exacerbations, um, a lot of panic attacks that kind of mimicked um, someone, you know, someone was having some type of respiratory emergency. Um, but also there's the uh, potential for cardiac arrest and heart attack, okay? So the heat, cold, and exercise-associated illness. So um, out in these summer festivals that we'll be going to, sunburn is um, very likely, uh, especially because a lot of people like to stay outside and wait until their preferred artist uh, comes to the stage. So they're just outside all day in the sun and probably aren't protecting their skin or hydrating well. Um, and so sunburn, we do want to make sure that we're paying attention to sunburn because a lot of people think it's pretty benign, but unfortunately, um, if the sunburn is severe enough, it uh, can draw that fluid to the surface of the skin and away from the body and can uh, result in um, severe dehydration. And so we want to look for people who might be uh, fainting, they have low blood pressure or extreme weakness. Um, and so if you do notice that, I would really encourage um, you to alert um, the like PFD or the medical personnel on site. Um, and if necessary, you know, if the person is um, 
you know, found unconscious or not breathing, you don't feel a pulse, of course, um, start CPR right away. But we essentially just want to make sure that this person is uh, receiving medical attention immediately if you suspect um, that they're going into dehydration or shock or severe dehy dehydration and shock. Um, but we also might see people with just the general heat rash. They may come to the, they might come to the entrance of the med tent. They might not actually make it in there, but um, it, it kind of looks like little red clusters of small blisters that kind of look like pimples, usually are found on the neck, chest, groin, or elbow creases. Um, so it's important for those people just to instruct them to stay in a cool, dry place, keep their rash dry, and when they get home, they can possibly use some type of powder. Of course, we, we don't want to recommend talcum powder anymore, but, um, or some, something to soothe that skin, okay? If we do have someone that has sunburn that has resulted in blisters um, or just sunburn in general, when they get home, they can, it's important that they stay out of the sun until the sunburn heals, put cool cloths in those sunburn areas or take a cold bath, put, put some type of moisturizing lotion on the sunburn areas. Um, you know, the, the traditional is the aloe vera gel. And then of course, we want to make sure that people don't break those blisters because of course that can introduce some type of infection and we don't want to do that. Okay. So there, there's heat cramps. Heat cramps, of course, may be seen definitely during a marathon event. Usually people come to a med tent with very severe heat cramps. Um, and then of course, being outside at the festivals, people might are probably severely dehydrated, um, are in need of electrolytes and will come to us with heat cramps too. Um, but heat cramps are characterized by heavy sweating during intense exercise, um, or just something that's like muscle pain or spasms. Um, kind of, I to when I'm giving this presentation to the general public, I kind of say it feels like a Charlie horse, um, a very severe Charlie horse. So if someone is experiencing heat cramps, it's essential that they stop the physical activity and move to a cool place. Um, they can drink water or sports drink. Uh, when we're in the med tent, they usually have. Um, soup, very salty soup, or Gatorade um, that's very disgusting to taste, um, but we like to give that to the runners uh, just to, to help replenish some of that, that salt that they, that they lost. Um, and then we also want to make for those cramps to go away before they do any more physical activity. Now, they're typically in a med tent with us, um, so that medical attention is right there, um, but say you're at just a little first aid tent away from a medical tent. Um, that has like the more uh, the supplies that can deal with something that's of a higher acuity acuity level or severity level. If that person's cramps are lasting longer than an hour, if there's someone who expresses to you that they're on a, on a low sodium diet, or if that person um, has also expressed that they have a, a heart problem, it's essential that that person receives medical attention right away. Okay, um, and so an MRC volunteer can can of course alert EMS. If, you, if there's not anyone close to you, you can even call 911. Um, but it's essential that these people in that category at the bottom seek medical attention right away. Okay. So heat exhaustion, we're getting a little bit more severe here. So heat exhaustion is looking like heavy sweating, cold, pale, clammy skin, fast, weak pulses, nausea or vomiting, muscle cramps, tiredness or weakness, dizziness, headache, fainting, or passing out. And so if you believe that someone might be experiencing heat exhaustion, it's essential that they move to a cool place. Uh, and it's a, it's a loosen their clothing. Um, if, if available, put cool uh, wet cloths on their body or take a cold bath. This past summer at Made in America, we would get towels um, that we dipped in ice water and started just putting them on people's back. Uh, their, the back of their neck, on top of their head, under their armpits, in their groin are great ways to cool people down. Um, and then at this point, it's appropriate for them to sip water. And there's, there's usually some water bottles inside of the med tent, or they'll have cups for you to fill up with water. Now it's essentially, it's essential to seek medical, that that person seeks medical attention right away. Or if you're in that tent with the person to alert EMS that that person, if this person is throwing up, if the symptoms are getting worse or the symptoms are lasting longer than an hour. And usually at this point, um, they, they would probably move on to the hospital anyway. But if this is occurring, that is just, it's, 
imperative that the person ha uh, receives medical attention right away because it might not be heat exhaustion. It could be something more severe um, like heat stroke. Okay. So if any of the symptoms are listed above are noticed or observed when you're on a deployment, MRC volunteers must notify EMS and the available medical team and lead that individual to a treatment area. Um, and also once that person is seated, volunteers can help raise the runner, the person's legs. The runner, the festive goer, they can raise their legs above their head while they're taking vital signs, grabbing a sports drink or soup. Um, and they can also re retrieve the IV fluid and tubing. So it's really, you guys will be in teams so people can be designated to do these certain tasks, but raising someone's legs in this situation is a really easy way of um, helping that blood return to those essential organs, okay? Um, and, and often in the, in the beds usually will accommodate you and help you uh, keep that person's legs up. Um, but just keep that in mind because it really is just an easy um, way of helping someone quickly. Now there's heat stroke. So heat stroke is uh, someone who might have a body temperature that's above 103 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, if at a marathon event, usually the medical team on site will do a rectal temp, but we're not going to do that. Um, if you're able to, and you, you do notice that that person's temp is showing up orally at above 103 degrees, that's a balance to alert someone. The person will probably be hot, red, have dry or damp skin. Um, they might display a fast, strong pulse, experiencing a headache, dizziness, nausea, confusion, or they may be losing consciousness. So in this event, if, you know, alert medical, um, the medical team or EMS on site immediately. It's important to move the person to a cooler place, help the person lower their body temperature with cool cloths or cool bath. Typically in these med tents, especially when you're at a marathon, there's an ice bath. Um, and so they will dunk a person in an ice bath. Um, often these, these people may be confused and I've witnessed someone throwing the ice off of them, but it's essential to keep uh, those cool cloths or ice on the person um, so, and so before they are transferred uh, to a hospital. And at this stage, if someone's losing consciousness um, and they're, you know, they're, if they're not conscious, this, the reason why it says do not give the person anything to drink at this point is because we don't want them to aspirate. Okay, so um, it's, just, it's more imperative to cool off their body uh, and, and not force any water into their, into their mouths. Okay, are there any questions about that? All right, excellent. So yes, here's that quick intervention I was telling you about. Elevating the feet of someone who's dizzy or unconscious um, is a really quick and easy and effective way of directing that blood back to the essential organs. So just see, just like this person is doing, or use the cot that uh, PFT has on site uh, will assist you in raising the person's legs and keeping them raised. There's also the chance of hypothermia. Like when we were doing the Philadelphia Marathon, it is absolutely freezing cold during that race. Um, so hypothermia is caused by prolonged exposure to cold temperatures and can even occur if the, temp if the outside temperature is above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So a body temperature that's too low can affect the brain and making it difficult for people to think clearly and can impair their judgment. And so usually we'll see with our runners, they might be experiencing like early signs of hypothermia, but we'll keep running because they're just not making, they're not able to make the, the best decisions. Um, when they're in this state. And so people who remain outdoors for long periods of time are, are at high risk. And so our runners doing a full marathon are at high, high risk um, just because that is a lengthier race and it is usually very cold during the Philadelphia marathon. Um, and so those signs uh, and symptoms look like shivering, someone's body temperature is below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they're, they're feeling exhausted or tired. They're, they're confused. They have like fumbling hands or trembling, trembling hands, uh, memory loss, slurred speech, or drowsiness. And so if someone appro approaches the medical tent um, and you notice these symptoms, um, it's essential to alert personnel as soon as possible. Get that person to a warm shelter, so the, the medical tent. Remove any of the wet clothing, so that clothing they've been sweating in, because that's just doing nothing but making them stay cool. 
Um, you want to warm the person, um, the, the center of the person's body. So their, check, their chest, their neck, their head and groin um, using the materials that are available. Usually on the outside of the tent, they hand them an emergency blanket, but inside the tent, there's, there's uh, other options. And then you want to provide a warm drink um, and there's usually like a warm soup that's available, but of course not to someone who's unconscious because of course there's the risk of that uh, aspiration. And then if, uh, if needed, uh, perform CPR. So then there's frostbite. Um, so it's an injury that's caused by very, very low temperatures. And so symptoms are kind of look like the loss of feeling and color in the affected areas. So typically the nose, ears, cheeks, chin, fingers, and toes, so those uh, extremities um, that are typically very exposed to the cold uh, are most affected. The skin will usually appear white or grayish or like yellow, purplish, brown, or ashen skin. Um, and so depending on um, this person's skin tone, it may, may appear more ashen or uh, waxy than anything. Um, so, and if, if the skin also feels a little bit more firm, if, they're, if the person's experiencing numbness, that could be a sign that they're experiencing frostbite. And so if not treated, it can lead to amputation of the affected body parts, but because we're such great volunteers, we're gonna make sure that the person receives treatment right away. And so um, the treatment would probably include getting that person to a cool area as much as possible, alerting that medical staff as soon as possible. Um, and unless absolutely necessary, it's important to make sure that that person isn't walking on those on the feet that are showing signs of frostbite because it could increase the damage. So we want to make sure that we're putting them in a wheelchair to lead them into the bays. Um, don't rub the frostbitten areas or massage it at all. Typically, when we're cold, we do one of these numbers um, that can also uh, increase the damage. If warm water is not available, um, warm the effective areas using body heat. And um, so don't use any heating pads, heat lamps, or heaters for warming the affected areas because, because those, the skin is typically numb, um, they, can, they might not know that, that, that whatever they're using is too hot and it can um, easily burn, that you can easily burn someone that way. Um, and then also check if someone's hypothermic. Um, I'm so sorry, my, my dog is, my dog is uh, trying to get into the camera. Okay, so now we're going to see, look at the injuries and uh, illnesses and injuries that are seen at festivals. But before I continue, just want to make sure there's no questions. All right, so first there's the minor injuries. So we'll see lots of cuts, scrapes, and grazes. At the marathons, they usually put a a speed bump to cover the wires right at the finish line where people are tired and so people trip and fall all the time. Um, so if someone does come to the, the tent, usually they won't go inside the tent because that's usually reserved for the more severe injuries. Um, but if you're outside of the tent and stationed out there, it's important to perform hand hygiene and put on some gloves. You want to rinse the abrasion with some cool clean water, remove the uh, remove the dirt and debris. They usually have some type of saline spray. Um, I would kind of caution using peroxide iodine or rubbing alcohol. Um, it's not completely necessary and may actually cause more discomfort for the area. Uh, if to stop the bleeding, just gently uh, apply some firm pressure uh, using a, a clean cloth or gauze, and then cover the, the wound with a sterile bandage or gauze pad and tape. And if available, someone can have some antibiotic ointment um, that can be applied to the skin before the dressing is applied. Oh, we, I think we actually do have a question. Um, so the, the question in the chat was, are ambulances able to get past gated events like um, in Made in America? Yes, they are. Um, actually, the PFD will have um, ambulances waiting inside. Um, and the area where the med tent is is usually situated. So it's, uh, they have a street that they, that's easily accessible and, and without much traffic. But great question. All right. So then there's blisters. Um, we see lots of those. Uh, people usually wear very uncomfortable clothing or shoes. Or and of course our runners, they've they're prone to blisters uh, for running these very long races. So if you if someone does come to you with a blister, perform hand hygiene. Of course, use gloves. Wash the area gently with uh, mild soap or that saline spray that PFD um, supplies. You can apply antibacterial cream or ointment if available. 
cover the blister with the bandage or gauze and instruct the patient to not pop, um, break or peel off the skin of that blister. If it's, if you know, later or if it's already popped um, because we don't wanna introduce infection to the area. And if available, refer them to the podiatry team. Um, usually there's a podiatry team on site and they're usually full of like podiatry students. And so they're very eager to help even with blisters. Um, so just definitely refer them to, to, to them. And then, so there's the mus muscular skeletal injuries. There's not really much that we can do um, as, as MRC volunteers, um, but when the person's home and recovering, it's a, you can inform them to follow RICE. And so RICE is an acronym just, that just means rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of RICE. My first degree is in kinesiology, so this was our like go-to answer for a lot. <laughs> Um, so the shin splints uh, are typically developed um, after, uh, and will be, and people will have the pain uh, post physical activity, and it's typically associated with running. And so the signs and symptoms are pain along the um, inner edge of the, the the shin bone or the tibia, and the treatment really is just rest, ice, um, and stretching. But if the patient, it's important that you guys instruct patients to seek treatment if the pain is localized, the pain is worse in the evening, or if the area of the pain increases. Um, but again, this is something that's probably not going to be seen inside the tent, but it's something yeah, you as a volunteer can address outside, right in front of the tent. There might be joint pain, so uh, which is like just pain, stiffness, and swelling, and it can be a normal occurrence after exercise. That acronym RICE is recommended in this case, and the patient should be instructed to see a doctor if the pain is sharp, stabbing, constant. Uh, it's a pain that causes a limp. It's a pain that lasts longer than two hours after exercise or worsens at night. Pain or swelling that does not improve with rest, medication, hot or cold packs. We wanna say cold. At least what I learned in school when I was in kinesiology was cold packs first and then hot for the um, more chronic pain. And then um, if, the, if there's a large increases in swelling or, or uh, in the joints that feel hot uh, or red, that's a, that would be a, something that they should inform their doctor about. And then so injuries that volunteers may see but fall outside of the MRC scope of practice would be sprains, fractures, muscle strains, and muscle tears. If you suspect that someone may have one of these um, injuries, MRC volunteers can escort a patient to the appropriate medical team on site. And so it's typically someone that, that would be someone that is seen inside of the tent. All right, so then there's cardiac and respiratory emergencies. This could, of course can be seen at a festival or a um, marathon. So we see a lot of asthma exacerbations, especially at the um, festivals when people are pushing against each other, uh, causes a lot of a lot of crushing um, injuries that that are that can happen. There's lots of smoke, uh, and people who do have a history of asthma typically have a very tough time at these um, festivals. So the signs and symptoms usually include wheezing, coughing, uh, chest tightness, or that becomes severe and uh, and consistent. It's um, it's being pretty hard. It's too hard to to speak because they can't breathe. Um, they're breathing faster, they have a fast heartbeat, there's drowsiness, confusion, exhaustion, or dizziness, um, blue lips or fingers, and then fainting. And so if you do notice someone um, is it might be experiencing a asthma exacerbation, bring them into the tent and, and uh, alert EMS or, or the medical team on site. But in the meantime, while someone is uh, setting up all the wires and, and trying to get their, their vital signs, you can help by keeping the person sitting up straight, trying to keep them calm and instruct the patient to use their inhaler if they have brought one with them. And so then there's the cardiac emergency or heart attack. Um, so signs and symptoms of a heart attack usually include like mild to severe chest pain, uh, pain that radiates, radiates to the arm, shoulder, neck, jaw, back uh, and towards the waist, shortness of breath, 
nausea, stomach discomfort, heart palpitations, anxiety, or like a feeling of impending doom. They talked about a lot when I was in nursing school. Um, sweating, lightheadedness, uh, dizziness, or passing out. And so if you suspect that someone um, is having a heart attack or you it could potentially be one, it's important to immediately notify um, the medical personnel on site, so the EMS or the medical team. Try and keep this person calm because uh, the panic attack really will not uh, make the situation any better. And the person becomes unconscious and unresponsive. If you have already notified e EMS, uh, you can assess the airway, check for pulse, and, if, and of course, um, if necessary, start CPR. And then if there's a sudden cardiac arrest, which is possible anywhere we go, of course, um, but especially at these uh, large special events, signs and symptoms include sudden collapse, there's no pulse, no breathing, loss of consciousness, um, and signs and symptoms that may be leading up to the cardiac arrest. Someone might have complained about chest discomfort, shortness of breath, weakness, fast beating, fluttering, or pounding heart, or like heart palpitations. And so it's essential that you notify EMS or the medical team immediately. If you have already uh, notified EMS, you should assess the airway, check for pulse, and of course, start CPR. It's essential to not delay CPR um, as, uh, as to, to make that person's outcomes a, a lot better. And then there's a uh, compressive or static asphyxia. So like I was saying, uh, at these festivals, especially Welcome or uh, Made in America, people have been waiting outside all day for a headliner. And there's typically a lot of people that are pressed up against the gate. And once that headliner comes on, the crowd from the back will surge forward and crush people um, because they're so excited. Um, and so compressive or static asphyxia is when the body is deprived of oxygen due to an external force limiting one's ability um, to sufficiently expand their chest. And festival goers will be um, removed from the crowd and their needs will be assessed um, prior to entering a med tent. And so typically like this summer with Bad Bunny, a lot of people were pulled from the front, were given the, a chance to get some air. Um, and if they're still, you can still, they're st still tell that they're in distress, they then will take them into the, the med tent. And often um, CPR might be needed in the event that someone really has um, been, been physically crushed by a crowd. And so um, there's lots of panic attacks because of course, feeling like you're being crushed and in, in, uh, incite a lot of anxiety in someone. Um, and so panic attacks typically mimic signs of heart attacks. We can also worsen a panic attack, but the symptoms include headache, nausea, rapid heart rate, dizziness, unsteady lightheadedness or fainting, um, sweating, tightness in the chest and throat, fear or that sense of impending doom, shortness of breath, shaking, numbness or paresthesia. And so the treatment um, would include assisting that person with deep breathing. And these people would typically be on the outside of the tent and then kind of like rows of chairs. Um, but you, in that case, there's usually an MRC volunteer uh, assisting people with deep, uh, deep breathing, helping them count their breaths um, for inhalation and exhalation. Uh, helping them hydrate, cool compresses. And if someone does have a history of asthma, um, they, will they will be taken into the medical tent. So here I just listed um, some videos or trainings I would, I would highly encourage for you all. I'm, I'm not gonna play them, um, but if you, you can please watch them on your own time or, or obtain a training. Um, in, in, in the very near future before you do do any special events, uh, just because they are, uh, they can be very, they can be life-saving. Um, so this is a Narcan training. Uh, Narcan um, is typically used, is used uh, to reverse an overdose or a suspected overdose. And even if you don't know if the person's taken any um, opiates, Narcan will still be used just because we want to make sure we're exactly using all of our options. Um, so I would highly encourage you to watch the Narcan training or attend a Narcan training that MRC, I believe, puts on. 
So of course there's a adult CPR. You wanna also do the child CPR um, because children will also be at these uh, festivals or special events. And then MRC does have a stop the bleed training. Um, if you haven't been to one through MRC, I would encourage you to attend one um, because stop the bleed, it's, it's very important. It can be essential in, in saving someone's life. Okay, so, but when in doubt, always consult a PDPH medical ops lead like myself or maybe someone else um, on site that's with the city of Philadelphia that is a clinician, but always consult them if they're designated the medical ops lead. Um, MRC volunteer lead. So typically, um, if I'm not there, or if I have to leave early, I usually designate uh, Marlin is, uh, has, has been a medical um, lead. I don't know if she's on the call today. I've also in, uh, in designated Stone. Um, Stone, I think, is on the call today. Um, but just usually, if I do have to leave someone, I will typically designate someone to be that, that med ops lead in my absence. Um, or another on-site medical team lead. Um, so if it's someone with EMS, Penn Medicine, or Jefferson, or whoever we are partnering with, or um, we are helping that day, uh, just uh, uh, consult them if you if you have any doubts. Okay, so are there any any questions? I know I just went through a lot, and it's a little bit over time, but I just want to make sure that I give you guys a chance to ask questions. I've been keeping an eye on the chat and there hasn't been any questions so far. Um, but if anyone does have any questions they wanna raise right now, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Um, if not, and you think of any questions later on, you're always, again, welcome to contact us and we'll answer any questions you may have. Um, I just wanna say thank you to both Sydney and Brianna for participating in this training this evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, where can you stop? Yes, so I did drop in the chat that there will be a stop the bleed training this Saturday at our office building um, at 11th and Market Street. Um, I did send out a round of emails for people who had initially signed up for it, but if you did not, no worries. I'll be sending out um, another reminder tomorrow. Um, so I did see someone just asked about that. So Bridget, uh, email me, please. Email MRC at philo.gov if you guys are interested in attending this in-person stop the bleed training. It is right now, I, it's from nine until 12. PM. Um, it'll be a, a presentation that our instructor, Nora Kramer, will provide for, um, for everybody. She's from Jefferson. And um, we'll also do an in-person or a hands-on portion as well, where you can actually take, I believe she'll be bringing like the limbs with like the slashes and stab wounds and all that. So be able to like practice some of those skills you'll, you'll learn um, during that presentation um, hands-on in real time. So yeah, that hopefully that answered anyone's questions. We would love if you all could join us. Um, we'll be hosting another Stop the Bleed training because we do have a limited capacity of 40 people for this specific training, just given the space we have, but there will be others and we'll do these in sessions, um, you know, just continuing. So you'll hear more about those trainings um, soon. So if you don't make it to this one, or if you're not able to make it to this one, there will be others, I promise. But yeah, with that, um, I'm just going to double check the chat one more time, just to make sure we didn't miss anything. All right, it doesn't look like we did. Uh, thank you to everybody. Oh, hi, Julie. Uh, thanks for, for joining us this evening. Um, that goes for everyone as well. Again, we appreciate your time, your participation, and your attention. We hope to, to see you all in the future, have you participate and partake in some of our volunteer opportunities. And just thank you for your service. We appreciate you being an MRC volunteer at the end of the day. So with that, we will sign off. I'll stay on for just a few moments for anybody who has any lingering questions or if you want to speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm here for you. I'll just stay on for a few moments. Other than that, take care, enjoy the rest of your evening and you'll hear from this, you'll hear from us soon. So yeah, good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Mary. <laughs> Bye. How are you? Wow, yeah, I haven't been down to Philly in a while for, for any MRC. I think the last time I was down was for um, uh, COVID testing. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, but we, um, more of my kids live in Philly again, so I'll be down more often. But um, I hope I can get down for that training on Saturday. So should I just email you about that? Yeah. Confirm mm -hmm. everything? Okay.
All right, great. Email me and I'll send you all the details and information tomorrow. And if you have any questions, just let us know. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Joe. I'll see y'all soon. See you soon. Take care. Good work. Let me end this, this recording.